Hello, my name is Ashley Peary, and as you can see, this is being recorded for the Fort Myers Seventh-day Adventist Church. Tomorrow, which is May 1, we're having a special mother-daughter brunch, and during this time, there's going to be a quick 10-minute seminar on how to have family worship in your home. If this is something you've done for years, praise the Lord for that. Hopefully, you'll take something new home, but if it's something you've never done before, hopefully at the end of this, there'll be some takeaways where you can start integrating this into your own home. So if you don't mind cl closing your eyes and bowing your heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to come together. Um, I'm the product of family worship. If it wasn't for this, I wouldn't be here today. So with gratitude, I just wanna thank you. Thank you so much that we have the opportunity to study this. And I ask that you please come into our hearts as we go throughout this. It's a privilege to honor and praise you twice a day. And we ask you to help us start doing this in our homes. In your holy and precious name, amen. So as you can see from the screen in just a second, we are going to go through quick tips on how to have family worship in your home. And to give you a little bit of background, I'm 37. My parents are Seventh-day Adventists. My grandparents and even my great-grandparents are Seventh-day Adventists. So family worship was pretty critical in our home. Um, pretty much from the time I was a baby, we would meet together twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. Um, just to worship God. And this is how I got to know scripture. This is how I got to know how to pray. And ultimately, this is what led to me accepting Jesus as my personal savior. Um, I used to think it was normal, but looking back, whenever we went to other people's houses, the only other people's houses we had worship at was actually at my grandparents. Um, everywhere else, it just didn't happen. Like, even if it was a church member or a friend, and maybe they were saving it for later, but it wasn't as common as I thought it was back then. So that's why during the seminar tomorrow, we just wanted to briefly talk about how to have a daily family worship as a family. Um, if it's something you've done before, that's wonderful. Keep doing it. Um, but if it's not, hopefully this will provide some easy tips on how to start integrating it into your home. And if we look at this first Bible verse here, many of us as parents, as teachers are actually familiar with this. It's Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. And for thousands of years, this has actually been chanted by Jewish people every single morning. Um, they don't chant the whole thing. That's actually only the first two verses. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And this was the first Bible verses that Hebrew boys and girls were taught. They were actually taught them by their father, who took the primary instruction role. And the mother was a close second, so she was very closely involved as well. And they would memorize this, and then they would memorize the rest of Deuteronomy, and then Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. So girls generally didn't memorize as much as boys back then, but most Jewish boys had all five books of the Pentateuch memorized by the time they were a young man. But the most important two verses were Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5, which reminded them that there was only one Lord, and that they were to love him with all their heart, with all their soul, and with all they might. But then Moses went on. And he specifically described how parents are supposed to teach their children. You're supposed to talk about it. You're supposed to hold it in your heart. He says, teach it diligently to your children. Talk of it when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. Bind them for a sign upon your hand. Let them be as frontlets between your eyes. Write them on the post of your house and on your gates. So family worship wasn't just supposed to be in the morning and the evening. It was to be this ongoing conversation when parents, were teachers, were friends, when elders in the church would just talk with the youth. And back then, a lot of people slept in the same room or in the summers, they would sleep on top of the house just so that it'd be a little bit cooler. So you were literally next to people as you were going to sleep. So you're supposed to talk about it when you lie down and when you get up. Um, a lot of people walked back then. So when you would walk by the way, when you would walk to church, walk to the market, you're supposed to talk about what God had done for you and what his teachings were. And then they even engraved them on some of the posts of their house and on the gates so that everywhere the children went, there was biblical reminders that there was one God and that they were to serve him with their whole heart, their whole soul, and with their whole might. And Ellen White elaborates on this even more because not only are we supposed to be talking about Jesus throughout the day, but we are supposed to have specific times of worship as a household. And in her devotional, My Life Today, this is what she has to say. The Lord has a special interest in the families of his children here below. Angels offer the smoke of the fragrant incense for the praying saints. Then in every family, let prayer ascend to heaven, both at morning and at the cool sunset hour, in our behalf, presenting before God the Savior's merits. Morning and evening, 
the heavenly universe takes notice of every praying household. So once again, that's so important. It says morning and evening, the heavenly universe takes notice of every praying household. And then she goes on to give some practical counsel. Family worship should not be governed by circumstances. You are not to pray occasionally. And when you have a large day's work, neglect it. And thus doing, you lead your children to look upon prayer as of no special consequence. Prayer means very much to the children of God. A thank offering should come up before God morning and evening. Says the psalmist, O come, let us sing before the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. So we're to be talking about Jesus throughout the day, but we're to have a special time in the morning and at the evening where we get together as a household and we offer up worship to God. And this definitely hits home for me, her second part here, where she says, we shouldn't let circumstances dictate it. Um, a lot of times I'm like that. Like I used to struggle with eating whenever I wanted or sleeping in whenever I wanted or doing whatever I felt like. And I've noticed in my personal life, I really need to be regular with scheduling because it's so much better for my physical health and for my mental health. And it's the same thing for our spiritual health. We shouldn't just worship God when we feel like it, because sometimes we will, but most of the time we won't. We do need to be regular. So maybe that means just coming up with a particular time. Um, I don't remember the exact times as a kid, but sometimes it was 6 a.m., depending on what our schedule was. So we would have worship twice a day, um, very set times in the morning, very set times in the evening. And the wonderful blessing about this is the heavenly universe takes notice of every household that comes together in prayer. So another great um, word of advice that was shared with me is to choose a certain place in your home. Um, it can actually be anywhere, really. Um, if you're still, um, if your family's still at that point where like, you know, you like to sit on the children's beds, you like to read them a bedtime story, that would be a perfect time. Uh, maybe in the living room. I know for me, it was generally the living room growing up. And we had all the Bible story series there. We had the Bible there. Um, I believe we had our Sabbath school lessons in our room, but sometimes we would take them out. And it's best to have one place so that the children know immediately at a certain time where to go and what to bring. Helps if you keep your materials there so that nobody's scrambling around. And it doesn't have to be this long drawn out performance. Um, worship shouldn't be a performance, but we wanna remember a lot of us, adults included, have short attention spans. Um, you don't really wanna sit there listening to someone talk for an hour. Um, there's a certain time and place for that. Um, sometimes like we have a Monday night Bible study where we study together for an hour, but we're aware of that and we come together because we're like-minded. But when you're teaching children, you don't wanna just talk for an hour straight. So short and sweet is best, maybe 10 to 20 minutes. Even if you only have five minutes though, that's definitely gonna be better than nothing. And Ellen White reminds us that we need to be regular and that we need to keep a time and a place for this. In the family order, and the family order should prevail. The members should be trained to regular habits. There should be a fixed time for rising, a time for breakfast, and a time for worship, either directly before or directly after the morning meal. And then she reminds us, it's the perfect time to talk about what God has done for us, how he protected us during the night. At the end of the day, that's the perfect time to thank God for his protection and to ask his angels to watch us during the night. So we want to be regular. We want to have those two times. We want to keep it short and sweet. We want to have our materials there so that when it comes time to worship, everyone in the household is ready. And there's different formats. Honestly, you can do whatever works best for your family. But if you just need some quick tips to get started, a basic format is prayer, Bible reading, prayer, short and sweet. If you want to add a little extra, you can put in some singing, some Bible memorization, a gratitude journal, some Ellen White writings. But if this is new to you or you're short on time, really all you have to do is pray, read the Bible, and pray. And we're going to go into that just a little bit more. When it comes to praying, adults should model the prayer, but children should learn to pray as well. Um, children's prayer are sweet music to the ears of Jesus, and even if they can't talk yet, they can learn how to sign to God. I never even knew that was a thing until we have some friends whose little child can't speak yet, but they sign. And it's absolutely beautiful that they're praising God at such a young age. And I know I'm guilty of this, but sometimes when we pray, we just ask for things. Help me have a good day. Help so-and-so to feel better. Help me not to be tired. Help me to be in a good mood. But prayer is so much more than asking things. So there's a little acronym on the right side here that might be helpful as you teach your children. It's called ACTS. A is for adoration. 
So we want to adore God and praise specific character traits. So you could say, dear Jesus, thank you for being merciful and gracious and slow to anger. Thank you for not holding my sins against me. And that's getting your children to praise certain things about God. And of course, it's all age appropriate. You know, when they're young, they might just praise God for being great. But as they get older, they might praise God for being patient and long suffering and full of compassion. The second part to that is contrition or repentance, specifically confessing sins to God. Um, this is something we want to teach our children to do at a very, very young age, for we do not want their sin to hold them back from eternity with Christ. So just teaching them to repent of their sins, and later on, as maybe as they get a little bit older, teaching how, them how to repent individually, but also corporately. As a church, we've sinned. As a nation, we've sinned. As families, we've sinned. And just like Daniel did in the book of Daniel, I believe it was Daniel chapter 10, he apologized for the sins of the nations, not just his own sins. That's really what contrition is all about. Thirdly, we have Thanksgiving, where we want to specifically thank God for things he's done. It's easy to thank God for pets, for food, for friends, but we really want to expand that and maybe thank God for putting out a fire that could have really gotten out of control. No, and of course, I'm talking about symbolic fires, but a lot of times there's like the potential for drama, there's potential for chaos, and then all of a sudden, God just like smooths the feathers, people move on, it's no big deal. That's actually an act of God, because he has 10,000 ways to provide for us of which we know nothing. Another thing we could be thankful for is the freedom to come together, or maybe the freedom to go to a school where people like us, or go to a school where teachers are putting effort into us. These are all things that we can specifically thank God for. Lastly, we have supplication. Supplication is where we ask God to do things for us that we can't do for ourselves. Um, I kind of chuckled because I went through this my phase, through this phase myself. My students have gone through this, but a lot of kids ask God, help me to have a good day. And I have to explain, you know, God's given us the ability to have a good day. We can choose to have a good day. We don't necessarily have to ask for that. A lot, another one I hear a lot too is help me to get an A on a test. And you know what? If you've studied, the Lord will help you. But if you've not studied, he's not just going to randomly get you an A on a test. Like supplication is something that we really can't do on our own. Maybe healing someone of cancer. We can't control that, but we can ask God to heal them. Or maybe softening the hearts of our political leaders. We can't do that, but we can ask God to do that. Or maybe to someone to be with our grandma while she's sick and help her. Maybe we can't do that if we're out of state, but we can ask God to do that. And that's really what supplication is all about. And prayer does not have to be detailed. Steps to Christ tell us it's like talking to God as a friend. But as children are able to learn, we want to teach them that there's so many different aspects to prayer. And this can be done in the family circle because honestly, it's not really done that much at school. And sometimes it's done at church, but not really because there's a lot of other things going on. So this is the perfect time for families just to take the time one-on-one -on -one to teach their children how to pray. And then the meat of the family worship will be the Bible reading and explanation. I know it's tempting to just like randomly choose verses every day, but when it comes to a chapter book, we wouldn't randomly choose sentences. That would be confusing for everyone. And it's the same thing if we just randomly choose Bible verses. Um, it helps to start at the beginning and go to the end. And you can go Genesis to Revelation, or you could just choose a book of the Bible like Mark or Acts, or Judges, and just go through the whole book. You can do a whole chapter a day, you can just do a couple of verses a day, but it helps when it's chronological, because then the kids aren't lost, and they're not confused, and it actually helps them understand the 66 books as a whole, so they can piece everything together. You can have your children read, or the parents can read. They can take a few minutes to explain the passage, and this is actually how I got to know the Bible, was through the Arthur Maxwell Bible story set, which you can see on the top right-hand corner. Uh, that's obviously an updated and revised version. We had the older one from the 1960s, but it's still just as good. Basically, it goes Daniel through Revelation at a child's readability. So parents can read it, children can read it, but it's going to explain all 66 books. And this might be especially for children that might not be able to understand the Bible yet. They can certainly understand these Bible stories, especially when they have a parent to explain it to them. I looked them up, I think on Amazon for use set, it's like $60. I think brand new might be $100 or $200. And it might sound like a lot, but it's not. It's definitely worth it. Like you want your children to know the Bible. We know the Bible is going to be taken away. The end times are upon us. Right now we have religious freedoms, but it's not always going to be like that. So you really want to get them to know the Bible. And this is the perfect way to do that. 
There's actually actually a whole set in the church library at Fort Myers if you want to borrow that as well. And Ellen White reminds us this is a perfect time to go through the daily Sabbath school lessons. Adults have their quarterlies, but kids actually have quarterlies too. And their lessons literally take less than five minutes, like two to five minutes. So you could actually go through that with your children every day. Everything is laid out for you. So you don't even have to reinvent the wheel. You just pray, go through their two minute lesson and then pray and that's it. But you were able to draw them closer to Jesus. You were able to start the day strong and you were able to give God the honor and glory that he deserves. Now, if that's something that's a little basic that you've been doing for a while, you can always add a little extra. Um, singing is perfect, especially if you're a musical family. If you're not a musical family, that's okay too, because together you can just praise God. This perfect time you can sing a cappella. You can follow along on YouTube. There's literally thousands of different songs on there. You can have your child play a musical instrument. And instead of seek applause and glory, like it's natural to do, they can actually play it for God. And you can actually get them in the habit of performing to the glory of God. This is a perfect age for memorization. Technically, we should all should be memorizing. But um, I teach at a classical Christian school, which is very heavy on the memorization. And the best ages to do that are pretty much from the time you can talk until high school. High school, you can still memorize. People go to college all the time. They're still able to memorize. Um, an old woman that I just heard about had memorized the entire book of Revelation in her 90s. So it's totally possible for all ages, but the age where it comes easiest is basically elementary and middle school. And at that point, you honestly don't even have to reward the kids. They're going to do it just because their parents told them to. You know, my students do it. I'm the teacher. I tell them to do it. It's part of their grade, but it really doesn't take a lot of effort on their part. When I was a kid, I did it because my parents told me to. So if you want to get fancy and do like, you know, star charts and incentives, awards, prizes, you can, or your children will just do it because you're the parents and because it comes easy to them. So you really want to have them at a minimum memorize the Sabbath school lesson. It's pretty easy. There's like one verse a week. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. Philippians 4.13. You can do God loves a cheerful giver or Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's pretty easy. The kids can memorize it in one city, and it's literally just one verse a week. However, you really want to maximize on this window of time. They can memorize a lot at this age. Um, there's some years where my students have memorized 150 Bible verses in one school year, and they're normal kids. Um, they're able to do it. It's not strenuous. It's not time consuming. You just do a little bit here and there on a daily basis. So at this age, you really want the kids to be memorizing what was created on the six days and seven days of creation. Um, what were the Ten Commandments? You really want them to know them verbatim because how are they going to keep the Ten Commandments if they don't know what they are? You want them to know the Beatitudes, the fruits of the Spirit, the armor of God, the promises of heaven in Revelation 21 and 22. And like I said, we're in the last days, so you really want them to know the Psalms for the last days, like Psalms 46 and Psalms 91. Mark Randall, who helps out with the adventures group at church, he teaches kids that are like, I think they're like six to nine, and already they've memorized Psalms 46 and Psalms 91. So they soak it up at that age. It's the perfect time to get kids to memorize. So once again, you might not have time for this every day, or you might just have time a couple times a week, but a couple times a week is better than no time at all. Also, you can have a gratitude journal. You could pick up a pretty one or just get one at the dollar store. And every day, somebody in the family could just write down a few things they're grateful for, and you could review those every few months and just rejoice on what God has done for you. And lastly, as Seventh-day Adventists who believe that we're part of the remnant church and we have the spirit of prophecy, you want your kids to be familiar with the writings of Ellen White. And I've heard stories of people being beaten over the head with her writings, figuratively, of course. Never happened to me, though. Uh, my parents, they read it to us when we were younger. They explained it to us. And honestly, the only resistance I had to it was when she called out something that I was doing that I didn't want to stop doing. That was really the only resistance I had. It was nothing that she was doing. It was honestly just a guilty conscience on my own. But 2 Chronicles 20, 20 says, believe his prophets so you'll prosper. And honestly, ever since I've been integrating what she has to say, my life has literally gotten a hundred times better. I can think clearer. I can function clearer. I can... Um, even my workouts are better when I'm eating the way that she says I'm supposed to eat. So you want your kids to actually look at Ellen White as being a blessing. Um, there's a lot of different books she writes. Um, some of my favorite are actually from the Conflict of the Ages series. It goes Genesis to Revelation. There's five books. Um, Patriarchs of Prophets goes through the Pentateuch. Then you have Prophets and Kings, which goes through the books of history. 
and the prophets. Then you have Desire of Ages that goes through the Gospels. Acts of the Apostles goes through Acts. And lastly, the Great Controversy goes through Revelation to the end of time. They actually have Conflict of the Ages series for kids. So you can buy them online. Just look them up. If you don't know where to find them, just email me. I'll get them for you. And you can find those, or you can read the adult unabridged version and just explain it to your children. And honestly, like if your kids are like in middle school, they'll probably be able to understand it just fine if they have an adult reading it with them. And this will really build their faith in the value of the prophetic word. We know there's going to be a falling away in the church. Um, Illinois actually tells us it's going to be over the testimonies. Um, which are her writings. Like people are not going to want to stomach the testimonies. It's going to call out things that they need to change and they're not going to want to do it. And I've been at that point in my life. So I see where she's coming from. But you want your children to look at her as a blessing instead of a curse. And the best way to do that is to have the parents be the ones explaining her writings to them. So like I said, we're going into a lot more detail because this is being pre-recorded. But for the seminar itself, we're just going to give some handouts and keep it to 10 minutes. But to wrap it up here, if you're already having family worship, praise the Lord for that. If you're not, it's never too late to start. As long as your kids are in your household, they can be 18, they can be 20. But if they're in your household, bring them together to worship the Lord. Really, all you have to do is pray, read the Bible and pray. But if you want to add a little extra, you can do some singing, some Bible memorization, a gratitude journal, and you can also read through the Ellen White writings. And sounds like a lot of work, but it's really not five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, maybe 20 minutes a day. It's up to you and your family. But this is a very, very famous verse that we definitely don't want to overlook. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. And I just love that picture. You know, the father's not home at that time, but the mother is teaching her little children how to pray. And you can see the older girl, she knows what she's supposed to be doing. The younger one is just a toddler, but she's gently folding his hands. She has her arm around him, teaching him how to pray to Jesus. And it might seem like all your efforts are in vain. You know, I walked away from Christ. You know, I'm sure my parents looked at this like, oh, all those years of invested effort, what is she doing? But I came back to Christ. And honestly, when I came back to Christ, it was, it was with more of a fervor, more of a passion that I had ever experienced before. Romans 8.28 says, all things work together for good to those that love God. And my sins are never okay. I'm not justifying my sins, but God used my life of sin to actually turn me around, to actually throw me at his feet. And instead of embarrassing me, God consoled me. He wrapped his white robe of righteousness around me and he elevated me. So I have an even deeper relationship with Jesus than if I would have never walked away. And this was because of my parents. If my parents want to have infused these truths upon me, I would have never come back. I was not taught these things in schools, even though I actually went to Adventist schools all the way until graduate school. I've gone to Adventist churches my whole life. But we had like basic teachings, but I never had the teachings or the investment from anyone else except my parents. And they're the reason today I've accepted Jesus as my personal savior. So please don't ever think that this is in vain. Twice a day, you're going to do it for 18 maybe 20 years if they live with you a little bit longer. And then even when they live the house, leave the house, hopefully you'll do it for the rest of your life. And please, please don't ever think that it's in vain. This is actually something that I memorized, but sometimes I get a little nervous. So I'm actually going to read it to you. And it's something I have to remind myself because as I'm teaching middle school, sometimes the kids will love me. Sometimes they'll hate me. And sometimes people forget teachers have feelings too. We're sensitive. And sometimes when they're being particularly rebellious or maybe rude, it might feel like, all my efforts are in vain. It might seem like all these Bible truths I'm trying to teach them are just cast to the wayside. But Ellen White reminds us that nothing is ever in vain. Teachers and parents should sow beside all waters, and if faithful, they may have a harvest of souls by and by. And when they shall see the souls for whom they have labored around the great white throne with crowns and white robes and harps of gold, they will feel then that their efforts were not lost. The well done, good and faithful servant will fall upon their ears as sweet music. So just think about that. Like your children could be in heaven because you had worship with them twice a day. So, so beside all waters, if you don't have kids, like if you're just a teacher, if you're not even a teacher, if you're just like a member of the congregation, so beside all waters, because someday, last day events actually tells us that everybody in heaven will have a crown with at least one star on it. 
And it doesn't matter if you have thousands of stars or one, she says, we'll be perfectly content, but somebody will be in heaven because of your efforts. So please use this time, cast aside all waters because we want your children in heaven because of your efforts. So these are some closing resources. If you wanna check these out, I can obviously email this to you. If you just email me, my email is ashley, A-S-H-L-E-Y underscore Ingrid, I-N-G-R-I-D at yahoo.com. Um, if you're at the brunch tomorrow, I'll have some handouts. You can take these home. But if you wanna go through and get to know the Bible better, you can do it with Ellen White's Conflict of the Ages series, the five books that go from Genesis to Revelation. Bible commentaries can sometimes be a little dry, she is not dry. She has done her research. She was a meticulous researcher. She had a lot of people help her out. So you're going to get the historical background, but she's actually going to explain things that oftentimes we overlook. So definitely check out those five books as you seek to teach your children about the Bible. Secondly, one of the reasons why I'm a Christian is obviously because of Arthur Maxwell's Bible story set. Like I said, you can get them for like $60 used on Amazon. Maybe brand new might be $100 or $200. They're also in the church library if you want to borrow them. But this 10 volume set goes from Genesis to Revelation. And when you finish it, do it again. When you finish it, do it again. Like pretty much probably for the first 10 years of my life, my parents just repeated cycles of the Bible story. But that was fantastic. I don't know how many times we went through it, but it infused these truths into my brain so that even when I was an adult, those truths were there and nobody could take them away. Also, if you want some more practical sermons and seminars, there's a lot of different personalities, a lot of different seminars on Audioverse. You can use it as an app or just go to audioverse.com, type in SDA sermons, and a lot of different sermons and seminars will pop up. And lastly, if you just want a quick and easy newsletter, um, you don't have to subscribe. This is just like a one-time PDF. Just go to pl-worship-bw-pdf at adventist.org. And they have quick and easy tips that you can start using in your family worship. So as we close here, um, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming out. Um, I talked quick, but it's because this is very important to me. Um, and as a teacher, I want my children to be saved. I want my students to be saved. I know you want the same thing. So I think if we could just all pray about this and hopefully make a commitment just to worshiping God two times a day, morning and evening, because we want our children in heaven. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the internet ability, the strength right now. I know sometimes it goes out, but thank you so much for allowing it to happen so that we could just get this word out there. Um, this is something that's obviously near and dear to me, and I ask that you impress upon all of our hearts a better way to worship you. Um, let us model heaven. People can't see heaven, but they can see what it's going to be like through your followers, and let us be full of compassion, of grace, of truth, of always bringing honor and glory to you. So be with us as we go back to our individual homes. Let's integrate what we've learned today. And I ask that you please come soon, Lord Jesus, in your holy and precious name, amen.